The product that we used is, uh, was originally this one at the top, well it was actually a few different colours, but it was the hospital pack and we amended it for community use. So it went to a third part of the assembler who put in the needles in the pack and an information leaflet and we physically drew on the barrel with a marker pen the doses um, because it was so unclear from the hospital pack. Thankfully we no longer have that and we now have a licensed pack um, which is much clearer. Um, so it does have five doses in each pack, so it's a multi-dose syringe. Uh, it's just the strength's a milligram in a mil, but two mil pre-filled syringe. Um, and really important that the whole pack is together and that the needles are there in the pack. Um, and it comes in this sealed uh, container. So unfortunately I've only been able to put up our data from up to March 2014 on here. Um, this report gets published every year and it's published in October um, and Information Services Division would probably have tried to sack me if I'd put on a slide actual figures but we're now over 22,000 uh, kits that have been supplied in Scotland. Um, so these are counted from every time somebody supplies an naloxone kit in the community or from the prison there's a form to be completed and that information gets collated by ISD. So on the numbers of kits supplied, but also on the, the, the reasons for why the kit was supplied, was it a first supply or was it a repeat supply? And if it was a repeat supply, what was the reason for that? Was it used on someone? Did you have it used on yourself? So from that, we know that there have been well over a thousand reported uses of take-home naloxone, um, potential lives saved. So always uh, important to keep yourself right by saying potential life saved because we know that uh, a lot of those overdoses may well have been non-fatal had naloxone not been available but even though we've had an increase in drug related deaths in 2014 um, there's no idea what those numbers might have looked like had naloxone not been available so it's certainly working um, and for me having worked in a treatment service and physically supplies people with naloxone. The benefits, if they're not, life-saving is not enough alone, the benefits outweigh that as well because the relationships that you're able to build with people and the satisfaction that they get from being empowered and being able to physically do something in an overdose situation is very satisfying to hear when somebody comes back and tells you um, that they used it to potentially save the life of their friend. <clears throat> so, some areas in Scotland were doing especially well with naloxone provision and were taking it on board and making it normalised and part of their normal structures and systems. And some areas in Scotland were not kind of taking it on board as well as we would have liked. So over the years we've um, developed targets for naloxone supply and these are based on the prevalence of problem drug use in the area. Um, so it started off at 15%, it then rose to 25%. And it's now that areas should be reaching 30% 30, 30 of people with problematic drug use in their area. Which for me is not really that great, 30%. Um, but the targets certainly helped to push areas along um, and to try and increase those numbers. So for me it should just be available to absolutely everybody as a start that you're seeing in services. And then trying to work on how you can engage people that are, more, uh, that are harder to reach or... Uh, harder to engage rather, they're certainly not hard to find. So moving on to uh, the prison service and how the prison service programme works. The, we have 15 prisons and these are where they're placed all across Scotland, the uh, dots and if you're quick enough to count them you'll realise that there's 16 and that's because one of them is the headquarters which is based in Edinburgh. Um, this is uh, HMP and Young Offenders Institute Grampian, so this is one of the newest prisons. So there was originally two prisons up in that Grampian area and they've merged together into this one prison, but they've had a lot of problems um, with the young offender population and they, they've, they're running um, at much lower capacity at the moment until they get their, their service established. So that's what one of the newer ones looks like. And this is one of the older prisons, which is Barlinney Prison, based in Glasgow, um, and has been around for a long time and certainly has a big turnaround of uh, prisoners, which can cause problems. They have an average daily population of up to 8,000 people. Um, when the naloxone programme was initially introduced, um, 
it was the Scottish Prison Service that had um, the lead of naloxone and they had the nursing staff under their organisation. But that transfer of health went to NHS in November 2011. So that created complications for us because we just started to get established with the naloxone programme in prison. And then there was a big turnaround and change of systems. So um, again, it fell back and then um, we're only just starting to get that um, back into practice properly again. They have addiction prevalence test in one month of the year and that gives us a, a kind of rough idea about substances that people are using on entry to prison and benzodiazepines and cannabis being the main substances and there's been quite an increase on people leaving prison um, with high um, numbers of people using buprenorphine and subutex or having that in their system. And around 20% of the prison population receive methadone. Initially when I was putting this slide together I had all these different things up on this one and I just thought I'd just take that all off and describe how the naloxone programme should work in the prisons. So if somebody comes into prison and they're identified as somebody who uses opiates, they should initially be talked to about naloxone, although that is not always an ideal time as soon as somebody uh, comes into prison. There will then be opportunities throughout their stay. There's an induction programme that is optional, but a lot of people will attend it for another um, talk about naloxone in that session. And then throughout the stay, there are opportunities for the nursing staff to be able to engage with the person and talk to them and do the brief intervention, five, ten minutes talk about what naloxone is, does, how it works. Um, and that's enough for them to have been trained. So never underestimate the potential outcome of a brief intervention with naloxone. There's so many times where I've spent five minutes with somebody talking about naloxone and they've gone on to use it. So it's not a complicated thing. It can be done very quickly. Um, so then after that, if the person's been trained, the nurse will then take the naloxone supplies down to the prison staff at reception and the prison staff will place the naloxone in the person's valuable property and they will be handed that valuable property uh, as they leave the building. So sounds pretty simple, um, but there are lots of uh, steps throughout that process where things can fall away um, and one of the main things that I would definitely suggest is that it's so important to have the prison staff uh, on board and aware of the product so um, being able to give awareness <laughs> sessions to prison staff is really important because a lot of the time what was happening in the early days was that prison staff just weren't sure what it was, they didn't feel comfortable putting something that had needles in somebody's valuable pack um, and then they were asking lots of questions to the person when they were being liberated which was creating a lot of suspicion among the person who was leaving so there were lots of problems um, not having the prison staff on board so that's an area that we're trying to develop more um, and definitely getting the prison staff on board is essential. The other thing that I would say is essential and that has definitely helped a couple of prisons has been the introduction of peer trainers. So we've been in and trained groups of prisoners who um, not necessarily have a history of opiate use, just as long as they've got good pe people skills. One guy in particular, um, within two months, trained 200 people in Edinburgh prison. And uh, I mean, that's just a fantastic example of the instant credibility that, that people have. He was introducing it at the induction phase and then had a pass where he would be able to go around different halls and just informally chat with people about naloxone. He would then give the details to the nursing staff who would put the naloxone in people's kits. So really fantastic work happening from some of the peer trainers. So yeah, so in an ideal world that would be how it functions. The prisons themselves now have a target to reach which is 25% of people who are eligible um, and that's based on the numbers of people who test positive for opiates at reception and the numbers of liberations each prison has. So um, yeah. Um, not a big proportion of people and they're certainly not hard to find so we just need to find better ways of the systems working to ensure that it, it works to its best potential. Um, this was just an example in Grampian prison when they had a, a quieter phase um, they were interested to have all their officers trained um, so I did back to back awareness sessions with prison officers and I was braced for uh, some severe resistance but actually what I got was something completely different 
and the prison staff are really on board with it. Training always resolves any kind of misconceptions or any anxieties that people have about naloxone. As soon as you're able to discuss it, it's a really safe medication, you know, very um, uh, necessary for people. Um, certainly you'll, you'll, you'll get people round. So these were the comments and certainly they were up for being more involved than they were and they were saying that they would be able to be in a position where they could encourage people to accept the training. If they were asked questions about it they felt more comfortable about being able to answer them and that whole promotional thing to help people access it was really useful. And I put that on Twitter after I left the training and got my knuckles wrapped from Scottish Prison Service. Um, but, um, however... So the next step for the prisons is that they've passed it through the union for prison staff to have access to naloxone in the halls. So if the prison staff came across somebody who had overdosed, they're now going to have an emergency supply of naloxone that they can use because at the moment they have to rely on nursing staff or if it's through the night there are no nursing staff working in the prisons the time it takes to get an ambulance into the prison is just ridiculous so if they're there on hand and able to use it then you know it's good news all round and certainly they're up for it so my next year is going to be focused on um, doing awareness sessions throughout all the prisons for prison staff so hopefully they'll be just as positive as this lot there were one or two randoms that uh, weren't quite so positive, but on the whole they were. So um, the numbers of opioid related deaths following prison release were what the baseline monitoring for the naloxone programme was, um, was based on. So don't ask me too much detail about this please, but I can certainly recommend a couple of papers for you to read if you're interested in uh, the detail of this, but really what it showed was that initially um, there were as we know, it's hugely high risk for people on release from prison during four weeks, eight weeks, and up to 12 weeks um, for overdose deaths. So we've seen a reduction in the numbers of deaths following prison liberation since the start of the naloxone programme. So you could say that perhaps naloxone has assisted in those reduction of deaths. So just to finish with a few key messages then, um, when you're introducing naloxone programmes, it's really important to prioritise the supply to people who use drugs. Um, certainly, uh, family members can witness overdoses, um, but they're less likely than people who are actually using to witness overdoses. So yes, it's really important to engage as many people as we can, but we can't lose sight of who the people that are most likely to witness an overdose are. So prioritise it to people who use drugs. Uh, normalise it in services, so it should just become the norm in service that everybody that you see in a service gets to take home naloxone. It shouldn't be a big drama, um, it should just become the norm. Certainly in the local area that I was working in, it was really refreshing to hear people saying um, that when they were using in a house, they all knew where the naloxone was and made sure that everybody was aware of where it was and how to use it. So just making that kind of normalised and prioritised in services as well. There's not many other interventions that you can do in five minutes with somebody that could potentially save someone's life. Um, make sure that people, people on opiate replacement therapy have a supply so we have readily available contact with these folks that are receiving treatment um, so it shouldn't be difficult to get it into their hands. Make the training brief. There is no point in trying to get people along to a few hour sessions and that being your only option. Um, in order to increase the availability it has to be opportunistic, it has to be brief um, and it has to just be while you've got the person there in front of you. Um, so five minutes is enough to give someone the skills that could save someone's life. Involve peer trainers, extremely credible. Um, sometimes where staff have difficulties engaging with people, the peer trainers can come in and just have that instant relationship with people um, and are able to do it. Although what I would say is one of the arguments that we have from a lot of staff who are not able to provide as much naloxone as we would like um, is they say, oh, well, people just don't want it. They don't want it. When I ask them about it, they just refuse. I don't buy that at all. Um, if people are refusing naloxone from you, there is something wrong with your message. So it's important that you give the right messages, that you can show that person that you care about them and that you genuinely want them to have naloxone and want to save their life or the life of their friends. So if you're not getting the message right, then people won't trust you and they certainly won't accept naloxone from you. 
And I suppose the last message is that the more naloxone that we get out there, the more likely it is to be present when an overdose happens and potentially save hundreds of lives. So, thank you.